Alice here and let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us again one of the most beloved guests on this show. The response I get for you and Arthur Herman, who's also going to be on again, is I think the two most popular guests. Uh, Dave Petruzza, who is an amazing historian, who I followed your work way before I met you. And let me rattle off a few books and I'm going to not even remember all of them. Let's see how many I can get. Uh, 1920, the year of six presidents. 1968. No, no, 1960, excuse me, which is uh, JFK versus um, uh, Nixon. You have 1948, mm-hmm. Truman versus Dewey. Uh, TR's Last War. Yes. Um, and then you have some baseball ones. Well, Rothstein. Rothstein. Well, that's a baseball. Yeah, it's a gangster book. Okay. There's only like two and a half chapters of baseball in it, okay. really. And the, but I got all the political ones, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, there there's the three selections on Coolidge. Okay. You know, Coolidge, uh, Silent Kyle's Almanac, which is sayings and the sort of potpourri of, of bios and funny stories and chronologies and pictures. And T, uh, Coolidge on the Founders and a documentary biography, which is or telling him his story through uh, documents, um, speeches, newspaper stories, things like that. Here's why I recommend your books so heavily and why I adore them. Because we can compare it to contemporary times. There's two ways to tell the story of things that happened recently. One would be Hillary Clinton represented the, you know, the interventionist wing of the Democratic Party. And then you had reaction from people like Tulsi Gabbard. When you write, you get the quotes and you bring its life. And you would be like, Hillary Clinton went in a show and said, quote, that Tulsi Gabbard is, quote, a Russian asset and, quote, the favorite of the Russians. And Tulsi responded by saying she's, quote, queen of the warmongers and responsible for the deaths of millions of people. So you, when you're right. quote, like hell. Yeah. But you also find the quotes where they're spewing such venom against each other. Yes. So instead of it being this kind of like academic, oh, rather, you're like, no, no, no. Sure, it was about the issues, but these people loathe each other. Mm-hmm. They spoke in very clever, inarticulate ways. And the talk about bringing history to life. You really see how these people thought, behaved, and hated each other. The book is about them. It's not about me. Yeah. So it's like, let them speak and let people hear their authentic voices and the voices of the people around them or who are watching these, you know, these dumpster fires of, yeah. of their time going on. And yeah, I'm not e- so egotistical to think I, I has to, everything has to come through me. And when I find them saying something interesting or something interesting is happening or something just weird or, you know, fun, I want to share it. I mean, if someone finds a good restaurant, you want to share it with your yeah. friends. So I guess my readers are my imaginary friends, and I want to share it with them. Speaking speaking of sharing interesting things, we just had lunch. Yes. And you said a comment to me, which I was incredulous about, and you had to text your wife. Yes, I And did. she has a response. Yes. Can you read your text and her well, response? I, I think so. <laughs> I could not believe this. It was... We're at lunch at Five Napkin Burger, and Dave insists to me. Well, I I seem to have recollected having ridden. A, well, you were showing. You started it. Okay, I'll, because, I'll start because again. Because you you showed me you were, you're like you're bragging about your wallet. It's made of giraffe leather. It's giraffe, you know. Yeah. And I said, I, I think I've I think I've ridden a giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You 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 were skeptical. No 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 no. That now you're 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 that's fake news. <laughs> well, I wasn't. I was in. I, Incredulous? I was insistent yes. <laughs> that if you had ridden a giraffe, you would remember this. This is not a casual, did I remember, remember ride a giraffe? You would remember having ridden a giraffe. I've, I've ridden many animals. No, that's not true. I, I've ridden a horse. <laughs> okay. I've ridden a, a camel. Okay. That's, that's many. <laughs> you, no, you are not. No. <laughs> So what did what I, I the, might have ridden a giraffe? <laughs> well, let's see what the wife had well, to say. I, I I said, "Did I ever ride a giraffe?" Which you thought was an odd message to send to your wife, and she said, "I remember a camel." Yeah. So so it wasn't definite. It was just her her memory of a of a camel. But you also but, but a camel, which would be half of many animals. 
That's true. Yes. Uh, but a camel is much more... A giraffe, I was also incredulous because I don't think giraffes are rideable because their back is at an angle. Yeah. And a camel is... But very, they could make like a platform to ride a giraffe. So it would be, you know, even. They could build such a thing. <laughs> they could, but they then could. I think you'd remember being on a platform. I didn't think it was all that memorable to have ridden a giraffe. <laughs> It is. They're two stories tall. Yeah, but they have a ladder you can get up on. <laughs> You've covered a lot of American history in your work. What do you think the one thing is that people get wrong about American history? One of the things is the Black Sox scandal. They okay. Get that seriously, seriously wrong. Yeah, and that's become part of our culture to the point where it's become moored. Say it ain't so, Joe. Yeah. And and people will use it as a as a way to beat you know capitalism over the head, right? You know the mean owners, blah 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 blah. Sob sister history. So something else we were talking about. I just had a guest, um, Mark Hyman, whose book uh, Washington Babylon was about the history of American political scandals. And in that book, he had made the claim that the Black Sox which was the White Sox team that threw the World Series, supposedly, yeah. originally had their name, the Black Sox, not because of their corruption, but because that their owner was so cheap, he never paid for laundry, so their socks turned black, unlike Heshi socks, which are excellent and awesome. I've seen them. Yeah. They're very attractive. But you're saying that that's a myth. Yeah, it's a myth. And, and the, the whole story of why the Black Sox did it, throwing the 1919 World Series, is because they were these oppressed working men, proletarians. <laughs> yeah. They were like, you know, a, they were being, they were the lowest paid team in baseball, or one of the lowest. They were one of the greatest teams in history, which they were okay. Um, and that they were stiffed on bonuses, particularly Eddie Seacott, their, their, their winning as pitcher. And as you were saying, that they were called the Black Sox before they were black, their hearts were black, yeah. because their uniforms were black, because the owner wasn't uh, cleaning them. And what really, starting from that, that small anecdote of the, of the uniforms, it's because the White Sox, Black Sox as a whole were so cheap, they weren't tipping the clubhouse guys to do this. And then the owner took some action of his own, dry cleaned them and, and docked their salary. And that, that's all there was to it. There's a couple, two days where they were playing in row uniforms, which are gray, um, because the uniforms are the dry cleaners. That's it. And the only reference in print that people can find is that Buck Weaver, the third baseman, was playing in a dirty uniform. And that's it. And that's because he was a hustler, like a Charlie Hustle kind of guy. Uh, the White Sox were, when the 1919 series starts, the third highest paid team in the American League when the season ends. They are the highest of the top 15 players in the American League. Uh, five of them are members of the White Sox. Three of them are, in fact, of the Black Sox, uh, who, are, who are supposedly underpaid. You know, uh, the, the salaries are all over the lot. Some of these guys could say they were underpaid. There's a whole no. And the war. They had finished sixth the year before. Why should they be so highly paid? Yeah. They, they stunk the year before. Um, so no, it's it's really and it's and and the narrative is told by a guy, largely a guy named Elliot Asinoff. I met uh, he was later in his life. Um, seemed like a nice enough guy. But he came from things from a left wing basis. So sticking it to the man like this was natural to him. He didn't have all the data which has come out that I just cited, so you could say that in his defense. But then, as we're saying about, oh, stories about maybe even giraffes, how the story starts one place and then goes other. So it's like, oh, uh, Charlie Comiskey was so cheap that, and the story builds with each telling. Uh, but Asanoff was, in fact, blacklisted in the 50s. Oh. So uh, very left wing, and he affronted for blacklisted writers. And he consulted a couple of guys who were very left wing authors, Nelson Algren and uh, um, uh, another fellow who wrote uh, another Chicagoan. And their heroes were Buck Weaver and Swede Risberg, who were you know two of the crooked players or two of the Black Sox who were banned. 
So they were coming at it from, you know, like boyhood memories of, you know, these are our guys. They were good. They had reasons. Right. But they, they, the reasons were they were crooks. And the story about the bonus, about the bonus being promised to Eddie Seacott. You what's, see what's this in the story? movie. Okay. The story is in the movie. And what movie is this? Eight, uh, eight Men Out. Okay. Uh, named after Elliot Asinoff's book. And so Seacott has been promised he will get a bonus of $10,000 if he wins 30 games. And he's held back by management so he doesn't get a chance to win and that 30th game. And then he comes in and says, can I get my bonus, Mr. Kamiski? And uh, 29 is not 30, Eddie. Yeah. <laughs> Evil, you know, Bond villain type guy. Sure. And it's not true. He got his chance. He lost it. He had been paid a bonus anyway, which he had been promised from the year before uh, when he led the league in losses. So he was the second highest paid pitcher in the major leagues in both leagues at that time and so again it's just it's like fake history it's just not true it's it's and and you're seeing more and more people you know understand that it wasn't just the gamblers who were crooked that the players themselves may have cooked this up oh if seacott went in league with the gamblers because he was stiffed on the uh, bonus we have accounts, his own testimony, that he's involved in the fix before that would have occurred, where he seasons end. And where Buck Weaver, another one of the guys, says Seacott was talking about it as early as June. So nothing, nothing adds up in the established narrative. I'm going to get, put my full Soviet hat on. Yeah. Because, you know, you could take the boy of the Soviet Union, you can't take the Soviet Union out of the boy. I can understand people getting excited about the Constitutional Convention, Revolutionary War, Jefferson versus Hamilton, Civil War, you know, all these figures fighting each other, right? The ninth, McKinley, Teddy Roosevelt. I can't wrap my head around baseball, huh. and especially baseball from 100 years ago. I mean, this is a scandal that everyone can understand that I appreciate. But the history of sports, like, it makes no sense to me why this is of contemporary interest because you can't watch the games no you can't but uh, you know um historical records have a way of popping up every so often and they just found in the yukon a newsreel of that series oh it was buried in the permafrost no yes you go to youtube and look this up you can see them going around the bases and talking in front of the dugout. And, yeah. Okay. Well, you you know you know the movie The uh, Passion of Joan of Arc or The Trial of Joan of Arc, uh, which is this wonderful silent film done by a, a Danish director producer, and it was it's it's all shot. Uh, he went to the producers, and he was going to get all this money to do all the battles against the English, and he double crosses them. They built the castles and everything, and it's all shot in extreme close-up, and it's just the trial of her versus the the churchman and the uh, you know trying her for heresy. This movie was thought to be lost or just pieces of it, and one day a guy opens up a broom closet in a mental institution in Norway, and a can of film falls out, and it's this film, and it is one of the great films of that era and maybe of all time. And so some of these things just pop up. But people care. Baseball is the most historical-minded of sports. You know, like people, I don't think football people or basketball people look that far back. And so it's nostalgic. And the movie Field of Dreams, which touches on uh, the Shoeless Joe Jackson story and the Black Sox, is about a father and his son. So there's a lot of sentiment involved in this. Um, and the contra and one of the things which drives the controversy is the Hall of Fame. And the issue is, does Shoeless Joe Jackson belong in the Hall of Fame? Because he had the third highest batting average in history and was really a great hitter. And and if things if Benedict Arnold hadn't have done that, okay, he'd be a great general. He'd be one of our top ten revolutionary generals. 
maybe one of our top three. He had a ben- better one lost record than Washington. Washington kept losing. Yeah. And, um, but so this, every so often somebody says we should let Jackson into the Hall of Fame. It just happened this year. He's very big in South Carolina, where he's from. There is a museum. His home is a museum. And I think because, you know, he's the sob story about how he really didn't throw the series and all that. He had a great series, but uh, he took the money. He took $5,000 from the gamblers. And that's somewhat suspicious. And that ties into Pete Rose. Sure. And whether you keep him out of the Hall of Fame or not and about gambling. And now, now baseball, you're going to have sports gambling. And what's going to happen with that? Will the gamblers get to the players again? Probably not because the, you know, the players are richer than, Cre- uh, richer than Croesus, yeah. as the saying goes. They got more money than brains. Uh, of course, they had more money than brains in 1919, <laughs> too. Hey, guys. Michael Malice here. I want to tell you guys about Mr. Alpha. It's a new line that they named after me. And they were very smart. You guys know I work out all the time. I had a pre-workout that I liked a lot, and I tried theirs. Here's why I liked it and switched. And I wouldn't be telling you this didn't happen. It mixes easily in water. It tastes great. And most importantly, it does what a pre-workout should. It changes you from, "Eh, I don't want to go to the gym, to get you off your ass to the gym and gives you that full workout. It doesn't give you that jittery feeling. And some of you like that. I used to like that. I like it this one better. It's smooth, you're up, you put in your work, and you come home. They've got a full line of things. They've got a volumizing shampoo, hair care products, beard serum, conditioners, everything you want, apparel, nutritional products. If you go to MrAlpha.com and use promo code YW20, you get 20% off. And I can recommend from experience their pre-workout. Go to MrAlpha.com, promo code YW20. Uh, so last time we spoke, your book 1920 had been optioned for a miniseries. Yeah. Now I heard a bit of casting rumors. <laughs> Is it true that Anna Navarro had to lose 200 pounds in order to play William Howard Taft? <laughs> well, I, I can't comment. <laughs> I can either confirm or deny. The um, but, but it's still going forward. Oh. And... Um, uh, it was optioned 18 months ago. Yeah. Which means it's, ex- which means it, ex- it expired. Oh, okay. But it was renewed. Oh, nice. Another check. Another check. Yeah. Checks are good. Yeah. But more so it, the promise out there of bigger checks and, and fame and fortune and all that. So Charlie Mathau is the fellow who had, Walter Mathau's son, mm-hmm. is the fellow who has optioned it and now re-optioned it. And um, he's developed a couple versions of a screenplay uh, for the first episode and is still charging forward with it. Um, it will be kind of interesting to make because casting, I think, you know, if, if you do a show a movie and you're got young characters, you can get people at the bottom end of their earning power and you can hire some very talented people coming in. You can get the cast of the deer hunter, you know, sure. Who are like kids almost, but you know, you've got to get mature people to play people in contention for the presidency. And worse, you've got to get people who look more like William Howard Taft and Anna Navarro. Yeah. Or more, uh, worse, worse, that they've got to look like Franklin Roosevelt or Theodore Roosevelt or people who know, you know, the famous guys. Maybe they're not going to know what Warren Harding looks like. I think, what's his face? Alec Baldwin would make a good Harding physically. Does he have Negro blood also? Well, you you know how that (laughs) played out. No. Well, what happened was, I think it's probably two years ago now. Time flies. And... There was a member of the Harding family who I think was a doctor. It was a family of doctors except for him. His parents were doctors. Everyone was doctors. So he's, he, you know, he reads these historical books too. And he wasn't really focusing on the Negro 
blood. Maybe we should back this up. In the 1920 election, uh, hundreds of thousands of handbills were circulated saying Warren Harding is 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 a Negro, and you don't want a Negro as president. And you know, it didn't quite fly, but you know, they weren't quite sure how to play this. I made this joke on Fox once, and they didn't realize what the reference was because because they're talking about Obama being our first black, yeah. black president. I said, "What about Warren Harding?" And they thought I was just being joking about Warren Harding. I'm like, "No, no, this is a historical joke." Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was it was open to question for quite a while. Uh, Harding himself reputedly said, "I know I don't know if one of my ancestors yeah. jumped the fence." <laughs> That's what he said. That's almost an exact <laughs> quote. Um, so with Harding, uh, you had two issues going on. One was the Negro blood and, oh, and they didn't know how to play it because if they came out and said, that's the most disgusting rumor we've ever heard, they would end up alienating the black vote in the North. Which was very Republican. Which was very Republican, yeah. but, but had been sliding, had been sliding for the past couple of elections. So you, you didn't know how to play it. Uh, so it's like, uh, unlike certain politicians of today, it was like, shut up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't, you don't have to go to every, every fight. So they, they kind of uh, let that one slide. But the other issue was, did Warren Harding have an illegitimate child by a, a young woman named Nan Britton? She wrote a book about it after, he was, she, after Harding was dead. And most people believe it, but... Some people didn't, and how do you prove it? And then the daughter died, but she had a daughter. And the Harding relative decided, let's get together with the Nan Britton relatives, and they ran the DNA, and bingo, bingo. That was his daughter. Wow. Okay? But the side effect of that was... What kind of blood does he have? Oh, right. He's white. Okay. So he's, you know, it's like, okay, we could stop talking about this. I thought this would have been a bigger story at the time. Yeah. Uh, but evidently, it's just one of my things, and, like, nobody else cared or something. I think— But, but you know, it's got sex and race and all the things that get everyone excited about and politics, but it's like, it just passed. Do you agree with me and with most people who listen to the show that Warren Harding is, uh, I'm not, no one's saying he's great, but that he is consistently underrated as president because they always put him last. And I think that's an absurdity yeah. or second to last. Well, there was just recent online poll and Buchanan, you know, yeah, sure. <laughs> held up as, again. Yeah. Um, he's, there are the scandals. Sure. I don't mean sexually, but he, there are a couple of, Bad appointments, really bad appointments. Corruption. Some of which he could have seen coming. As attorney general, nobody liked him, but he was the campaign manager. So I'm not going to be an ingrate, but everyone was like holding their nose on that one. The secretary of the interior was confirmed in like three minutes or something. It was the world's land speed record. I just read, uh, maybe maybe you know this, that after Warren Harding was elected or after he was sworn in, I think he literally, because he was the first sitting senator to become president, he stood at the in the Senate floor, read his appointments, and they just approved them by they a just went bang, bang, bang. Yeah. And Fall, who was the crooked interior secretary, was, was there was no controversy. Nobody saw that one coming. Um, the Veterans Administration guy, who was actually a, a favorite of Harding's wife, stole an incredible... That was worse than Teapot Dome, in my opinion. Okay. Stealing from the, the crippled, wounded veterans. Jeez, that was loud. Good Lord, of World War One. Yeah. That's horrible. They robbed the Veterans Administration blind. Oh, my God. Okay. Horrible. A guy named Charles Forbes. And then there were, you know, prohibition-related things with, sure. it, with Doherty and the Attorney General. Um, so there are those things, but they're balanced by some very good appointments, um, like Hoover, progressive as he was, um, Hughes, Secretary of State, Taft at the Supreme Court, and he gets the idea of limited government. He really is consistent and, and I think thoughtfully conservative, and he cuts the government as much as Coolidge does and sets the 
Coolidge Mellon tax cuts rolling. Coolidge finishes them. They're they're unusually uh, consistent in terms of ideology, president and vice president, because you don't yeah. always see that. There's usually some sort of friction, but the the policies are of a piece, and they're good policies. So he is underrated. I think he is underrated. Yeah, yeah. You know, the country does pull out of the depression. He doesn't mess it up. He gets the uh, government spending down. He gets the got national debt down. And um, even he, under his administration, they get like the eight-hour day in steel mills. You know, there, so there's some, some what would be called progressive labor le- re- legislation. And he frees Eugene V. Debs. Yeah, he does. He's not a mean guy. Yeah. He's, uh, people say, would, would he have dumped Coolidge in 24? I don't think he would. Why would he? Well, they thought that Coolidge was a drag on the ticket. How, how's that? Well, well, for one thing, vice presidents were pretty disposable back then. Sure. They weren't you know, treated as some sort of sacrosanct important guy because they actually weren't. But also... Coolidge was not charismatic. He didn't like to go out and give speeches. And he came from Massachusetts, which you were going to carry anyway. Right. Ohio was a swing state. Massachusetts wasn't. That's one of the reasons why you don't get nominees for president from Pennsylvania for a long time, like forever, after Buchanan, because it is for the longest time so crazily Republican. In 1932, Hoover carries Pennsylvania, and I think he carries Philadelphia. Oh, good Lord. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. T- times they is- had quite the machine. Oh, it, sure. And it was Republican then. You've covered a lot of American history in your work. What do you think the one thing is that people get wrong about American history? I think the biggest thing is is that how FDR got us out of the, of the depression. Okay, let's talk about that. I mean, that is, it's it's so big, it's it's obvious. I mean, Amity Schley's dealt with that in her book uh, about the Great Depression. But I mean, you see, you know, through eight years of of Franklin Roosevelt, we he barely moves the needle. I mean, people may not be starving because they're being given, you know, maybe a make work prod. Pro- project job or foodstuffs or something like that or a check, but we never really get full employment or investment. Well, the close. investment is very, uh, very badly hit, and then you see the second crash in the in the 1930s when all the labor legislation starts to come in, and it's not until the war when the economy sort of picks up, but it really doesn't pick up. Because you've got all these guys in the army, you've got people really almost working as slaves for in the, rationing in the defense plant. Yeah, because they're given money, but there's nowhere to spend it. Yeah, you know they have they don't have tires, they don't have cars, they don't have nylon stockings. You know they they, they can't buy meat by law. Yeah, by law you just can't. What year when you asked the FDR? devotees would they say the depression ends i never hear an answer out of them do they have there an is answer? no answer right there isn't one there, there there can't be an answer i mean well he got reelected, so you know so widely in 1936 things must have been great uh it's just that things had stabilized the bottom had kept falling and falling and falling uh with hoover so you just didn't know where it was going to end right with with fdr it there was a there was at least a platform but it wasn't moving up. Do you think Landon would have been a better president? Deeds, not deficits. <laughs> he he might have been, but you know, a lot of it is a lot of it is is salesmanship, and that and yeah. FDR had that in spades. I mean, he was doing the same stuff that Hoover was doing. Right. But you know, the great example is Hoover is talking about, oh, we're going to close the banks. We're going to close the banks. So you're not going to be able to get your money out for a while. And Hoover calls it, or wanted to call it, a moratorium. And it's like, boring. FDR, I'm declaring a bank 
holiday. <laughs> now, who doesn't love a holiday when you can't get your life savings out? Uh, you guys know I love my Heshi socks. I am currently wearing my Heshi socks per usual. The thing that's great about Heshi is that they're made with high-end Pima cotton, which is extremely breathable in the warm weather, but they're also treated with antimicrobial products and properties to keep your feet smelling right. If you go to HeshiSocks.com, H-E-S-H-I Socks.com, and use promo code WELCOME30, you get 30% off your entire order. These stocks last a long time. They don't wear out in the heel like other socks do. You have them, you can wear them to work, you can wear them at home. They're comfy as heck. They've got a lot of different styles that will fit with your lifestyle. And they are one of my absolute favorite sponsors. And I wear their socks with pride. Go to Heshi Socks, H E S H I Socks.com. Check out their new collection. Lots of cool stuff in there. Promo code WELCOME30. Let's get back to the show. Um, do you, I, I just recorded an sh- episode with t- uh, Tom Woods, the very failed podcaster. And one of the things we talked about was Woodrow Wilson and my contention that Woodrow Wilson was both the worst president and also the worst human being to be president. Uh, you've written about Wilson in 1920. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? He's unpleasant. Not sure about the worst human being. This is why I think he's so evil. First of all, he gives us Lenin, you know, and you know some of that has to fall at his feet. But also this idea, he's really messianic. In he his, is. That's, that to me is extremely evil. And, and actually rare yes. in the presidency. Yes. You know, even a guy with as big an ego as like Franklin Roosevelt or Theodore Roosevelt. Or even they Trump. Have, they have, yeah, they have some sense of perspective when he gets the presidency and someone comes to him who's, who's assisted him, it's, uh, he says, I owe you nothing. Divine providence made me president and nothing could have stopped me. Holy cow. Yeah. Holy cow. Not good. No. And the way he, he will turn on everyone who's made him president and... And, and these issues become life or death because they're his issues. That's the League of Nations. If he had compromised just a little bit on that, he would have gotten the United Nations or League of Nations yeah. for whatever that was worth, which wasn't worth anything, as we've seen by what how the, the United Nations has turned out. You know, Henry Cabot Lodge was right. This was garbage. Although I think it was Lodge who came up with the term League of Nations. Was it? At a speech in Union at Union College near where I live. And he, you know, people would toy with this idea before Wilson. Theodore Roosevelt would, Lodge would, there was Taft. Taft was a, a supporter of the League itself, and Hoover was. But it's, it's Wilson who it's like, this has to happen. This must happen. You know, or otherwise, it's the greatest calamity on the face of the earth. There's no other way to deal with this than through my way. That's that's where he's he's really sick. Yes. Yeah, and and, and uh, you know, just when you know Teddy Rose, that was in your book, I think, when Teddy Roosevelt dies and Woodrow Wilson just has this little smirk on his face when he hears the news. Not just a smirk, but he he's coming back from Italy to Versailles or Paris. And he gets there, and David Lloyd George is saying, I'm sorry to hear about your predecessor. Prime Minister of England at the yes. time, yeah. And, and Wilson just lets loose. And Lloyd George, who had been around the block a few times, said he was just stunned by the amount of vitriol that came out of Wilson. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, I think Wilson, you know, I use the term in my book, evangelical left. And my point is that the contemporary hard left are a direct line from Wilson. It's this kind of uh, um, millenarianism kind of idea that you have to save the soul of the country. He puts as much toward government intervention in the economy as FDR, and but, he does it earlier. But he also does it for FDR, I think, was like, all right, we're in a crisis. And he does it without a depression. Right. FDR is like, we're in a crisis. Things aren't working. Let's, let's try stuff. Let's throw things against the wall, see what sticks, yeah. right? I don't think FDR was an ideologue. 
FDR certainly didn't think, you know, the fact that he had, um, you know, his uh, opposing uh, Republican candidates in his cabinet during World War II, I don't think anyone had to put a gun to his head to do that. He had Republicans in before World War II. Okay. I think three of his first, in his first cabinet were Republicans. Right. Yes. Uh, Harold Ickes, Interior, um, a guy named Woodall or Woodson at Treasury who dies very soon, and Henry Wallace. Yeah. Not the Henry Wallace. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's a very big difference. And the idea that like we're going to get into World War I and this is our cover story to have intellectual control of the entire economy and run the country like an, a, like a barracks or a corporation – this is well, all the propaganda. Yeah, too. before Goebbels, there's oh sure what, what we put out during World War One. Yeah, I. so for these things, I, I just I find, I, but I think a lot of that stem it can be traced to today in a pretty direct line. So my point is, whenever I use the term evangelical left, a lot of times these boomers will yell at me like, "Oh, that's a contradiction in terms." I'm like, "No, these people, the the left, uh, this whole idea of like hardcore leftism and hardcore religion." He's very religious, extremely. He, so. he prays on his knees every every night. Yeah, but and, and I mean, there was this whole idea that we're going to save the soul of America, carry nation and prohibition. This went hand-in-hand yeah. hand with, with uh, progressivism. With, with Theodore Roosevelt, Roosevelt is, is, a, is a regular churchgoer. But when you take a look at why he thinks church is good, it seems to be because they're going to raise up these, you know, these ignorant people living in the slums, and, and, and they're, they're going to make real Americans out of them. That's sort of a, sort of a social gospel sort sure. of thing. Yeah, but Wilson was the social gospel incarnate. Yeah. Like we have to, you know, save the soul of the world through force if necessary. Yeah, and if you don't if you don't have the League of Nations, you're going to break the heart of the world. Yeah. But uh, the, the the most absurd example of his of his rigidity to me is when he's president of Princeton and we're going and there's a struggle over where you're going to locate the new graduate school buildings and he wants it right in the middle of everything and somebody else wants it right on the outskirts part of the reason is so you've got room for growth instead of having everything jammed in forever and and wilson makes this into a national issue and a moral issue Will the American people tolerate the segregation of graduate students in this most... It's like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> most of these people aren't even going to high school anymore right. or at that point. Uh, one of the th- other things that we attacked Wilson on was there's this myth, and myth in the sense of fiction, that between world uh, Civil War and the Civil Rights Era... It was a consistent, gradual increase for Black Americans and former slaves. In fact, th- things got better, and then things got a lot worse. Boom. And it was worse by design. And Wilson was one of the main. The, when when people say Wilson's a, a, you know racist, right? It's not just he's a racist by contemporary terms, which they all were. He was a racist by the terms of his day. Yes. Yes, and he was criticized by that for that by Theodore. Roosevelt, what you're talking about when things get better, I mean, blacks are freed and they have representation in Congress from the South, but then the progressive era, not the, or the pro- populist era yeah. comes in and the Jim Crow era, it's, it's pretty much simultaneous that the worst uh, parts of Jim Crow are where it all comes in in the rush, populism, progressivism, and a lot of the progressives are big time racist like Wilson you take a look at his cabinet it's very southern very southern and one of the things which swings the 1918 by uh midterms is not even the war it's that the farmers in the midwest are being told by the republican party that Wilson is favoring the farmers in the south oh okay so if farm policy and and if, and you know Burleson who was the attorney general and the and the postmaster general and the treasury secretary? All these guys, a lot of these guys are are Southerners, and they are going to segregate the Treasury Department and the local off federal offices in the Washington D.C. as they never had been before. So W. E. B. Du Bois, who was getting kind of tired of the Republicans, uh, actually under Theodore Roosevelt and Taft, they were pulling away from 
support for blacks. And we're trying to figure out how can we get the Republican Party in, among the white Southerners. So the blacks were starting to get like, we're not getting anything from these guys. Yeah. Let's try this Wilson guy, which is wrong. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But they, they thought it might work. And the boys- Who's the head of the founder of the NAACP? One of the founders. Yeah. One of the founders, a uh, big guy uh, in in the WA. Uh, he is the editor of their magazine. Of the Crisis. Their journal, The Crisis. Yeah. Later becomes a communist. Oh, yeah. I just finished a biography of him. Yeah. He's, he, and the what's fascinating, the Harlem Renaissance was in many ways a reaction against him. Because at one point he says all art has to be propaganda. And the work of the Harlem Renaissance was, no, no, we can talk about black people getting drunk and going to parties and treat us like everybody else. And to him, it was like the representation has to be uplifting the race and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. This is a big conflict there back then. There were big struggles within the uh, NAACP oh, involving, sure. in, in, involving him and, and the leadership. Eventually he's bounced because he supports Henry Wallace in yeah. 48. But in with uh, segregation, you see some horrible... There is in, I think, 1916, a lynching in Waco. A lot of bad things happened in Waco, Texas. Yeah, yeah. Heloise. Yeah. <laughs> okay, if you say so. She's from, she's from okay. Waco. Hints from Heloise, yeah. <laughs> so uh, a, a, a black guy actually, I think, rapes and murders a right, white woman. He did it, okay? And they convict him in like, you know, 35 seconds right. or something. And he's in jail and they're going to hang. They're, it, it's obvious they're going to hang him. But this is not enough for the people of Waco. And they burst in and they kill him. And they, they, they set him on fire and mutilate him when he's alive. It is horrendous. And they take pictures of it. There's like photographic evidence of this. It is really recorded. And the NAACP has a a representative somewhere in Texas at that point. I think maybe it's even a woman. And she goes into town and interviews everyone. So this is the best documented lynching there is. And it's horrific. And there's not a word said about this by the administ by anyone federally. Nothing. What year is this? This is like 1916. Oh, so it's Wilson. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is not like 1905 or something. We're moving towards modernity, sort of, except we're not. Certainly not down there. Yeah, it, it's it, th that's the other thing. It's, or oh. or the uh, race riots in East St. Louis. Oh, the, yeah, those are the big ones. Wilson Wilson actually plays a part in for, in fomenting that with the 1916 election. The Democrats talk about um, that the Republicans are importing black voters from the South. And and uh, you know having like basically vote fraud and colonizing parts of Illinois to throw the votes to them, and you know very racially charged stuff. And what is also happening is because of the war, the war shuts down the cheap labor supply from Europe. My ancestors are not getting in anymore. Yeah, it's not yeah. it's not the immigration laws. It's German submarines. Okay. And, and the fact that they'd be coming from actually enemy territory, they'd be coming from Austria or Russia or whatever. And so what, what happens is that the black labor comes up. And in some cases, they're like strike breakers. The yeah. unions are very much opposed to, to hiring black guys. So there's this huge race riot in East St. Louis. Again, there's no reaction from the Wilson administration. And Theodore Roosevelt, uh, there's a, a rally at Carnegie Hall to celebrate the new Russian democratic regime. This is before Lenin. This is Kerensky. And with Roosevelt is, you know, democracy is good, but keeping Russia in the war is better. Well, let me explain to people what you're referring to. Yes. So after the czar fell, yes. but before Lenin took over in 1917, there was a window where there was a brief parliament that Alexander Kerensky yes. was in charge of. People forget about this. this there was There's like two revolutions. Months. Yeah, there's two revolutions, right, yeah. And uh, so uh, Theodore Roosevelt is on stage with Samuel Gompers, the head of the American Federation of Labor. And, and Roosevelt goes bananas and starts shaking his fist and shaking and almost physically assaulting Gompers in front of, of this crowd of thousands of people at Carnegie Hall. Uh, uh, be, why, why, what's with the labor unions? Why did they do this? And so he, he's sort of uh, fighting for black rights then, 
But Wilson, Wilson had used some of the rhetoric about about the colonization of, of Illinois by black voters in that election. He's using the same rhetoric that the Illinois Democrats did, and that leads that's like putting the the, the flame to the fire on yeah. that. One of the things that drives me crazy is how so much, and I'm sure this bothers you enormously as well, so much of what is in popular culture as history is used as propaganda and is used to foment uh, ideas in people's heads, right? And we hear a lot, understandably, about you know slavery and uh, racism in the post-Civil War South, but we never hear about the North. And it's like, it's, it's just like, look over here, like it's a total like bait and switch. And it's like, things in the North, you know, after the Civil War and... To, I mean, even, even to like the '60s, it's not like it was some picnic. It, no, it, it, it's it's. I I was reading, just recently, the was it the Thirteenth Amendment that gives blacks the vote? I think so. Only like two states in the North allowed blacks to vote before that amendment. Yeah, there was also something called sundown towns. Are you familiar with this? No. Okay, see, this is another, I've read a book about, it's a hidden part of Northern history. There were these towns where if you were black, you could not be there after sundown. Oh, okay. And this is very prominent in the North Illinois, Indiana, places like this. So these are held up as like, well, we're the good guys. And to this day, the South is a whipping boy. And it's like the, another reference. Well, I, so, the Tocqueville says that the, the, the blacks are treated worse in the North than the South. right. Because there was a sense of kind of responsibility, right? This mm-hmm. kind of almost socialist kind of. Well, I think they had idea. more interaction than right. you had to. I mean, you know, you had to talk to these guys. Right, they're doing your your work. And it was I. One speaking of Harlem Renaissance, I read this book by uh, Jesse Fawcett, who was the Crisis's literary editor, I believe. She was uh, mm-hmm. a mistress of W. B. Du Bois, and one of her novels. And the the premise of the novel is about this girl whose passing is white, who's mixed blood, mm. and she meets a. Uh, black friend of hers outside a restaurant in New York in the 20s. And she's like, why didn't you get us a table? And she's like, I didn't know I could get seated. And then she's dating this white guy and to show off to her how racist he is at a restaurant in New York, a fancy restaurant, yeah. he tells the waiter to kick out this table of black people who are sitting there and he does it. Well, the, the blacks could not be in the audience at the Cotton Club. Yeah. Uh, they were not allowed to work in the department stores on like 125th Street. And there's a big, before there's a Montgomery bus boycott, there's a boycott of the department stores in Harlem around 1937. Blacks won't, until they can work, buy where you can work, shop where yeah. you can work. That's the slogan. And I, I, on October 5th, I was invited to give a talk at the grave of uh, Chester Allen Arthur outside of Albany. They do this every uh, birthday of any president who's dead. And the president sends a wreath and the National Guard shows up and somebody says a few words and that somebody was me. And it's like, what do you say about Chester Allen Arthur? <laughs> and I The facial said, hair yeah, was yeah, impressive. I mean, you know, <laughs> so... I said, well, there's, he's local, and he did some <laughs> stuff for the military. And I said, look at this statue here, this statue. The, it's an angel. The form is women. Let's talk about some women in his life. And the first one is probably one who never came up to Albany. But one day, on a Sunday, she was going up to church in, Bow- in the Bowery from downtown by City Hall where she was going to play the organ, and she got on a street streetcar in 1854-55, and she was black. And they threw her off. And the Third Avenue streetcar line was segregated and really roughed her up badly. And they- This they, is a woman. This is a woman. Beat her up and she went to her father, was a fairly prosperous tailor and was the first black to ever have a patent in the United States. And they said, what are we gonna do about this? And they decided to make it, they went to this famous, uh, uh, a pro-abolitionist law firm And the guy couldn't take the case because he had just been made a judge or something. He says, I got this guy who just here, he's pretty sharp. He's 24 years old, Chester Arthur. He can do it. And they bring a test case, not a criminal case against the the guy on the subway, the, the motorman, the conductor. They don't do that. They're not interested in playing small. They want to bring a civil suit against the against the streetcar line because it's where you have the pressure against the corporations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And Arthur, uh, they bring the case in Brooklyn in January, and they may have had, there's no Brooklyn Bridge. They, they either had to go through uh, on a boat with choppy, ice-filled waters, or they may have even walked across the East River. Yeah, on the ice. Yeah, to do this, and they win. And, and that, but up until that point, blacks could be thrown off of, of public transportation. And that 100 years before Rosa Parks, that was what was going on in New York and, you know, Chester Allen Arthur, civil well, rights leader. Let's talk about another president we just mentioned on the, our walk here, who uh, uh, I learned about this on Family Guy, who Grover Cleveland. Yeah. So first only president to count twice, to not right. consecutive terms. Yeah, yeah. And or hang a man, I think. But he's also kind of a pedophile. Uh, yeah, you could say that. Well, tell that story about the, 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 his wife. Well, his wife was um, one of his pals had, had died, and Cleveland becomes the ward, you know, like Daddy Warbucks of Little Wharf and Annie, yeah. of, of, of his daughter. And when she be, reaches womanhood, he marries her, that Frances Folsom. First lady of the United States, but formerly been ward of of uh, Grover Cleveland. It's as if Daddy Warbucks married Annie. Little Orphan Annie. Yeah, <laughs> he raised her since she was a kid as his daughter. Yeah, this is you know kind of what Woody Allen ter- territory, right? Yeah, yeah, but without the miscegenation, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> unless. Unless, unless Grover Cleveland had Negro blood. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. We haven't done the DNA. You've covered a lot of American history in your work. What do you think the one thing is that people get wrong about American history? This goes back, oh, 100, 150 years. The, people think that George Washington, the Mon- Washington Monument is named after George Washington. And it really is the reverse. So you've now been working on, can we talk about your next project? Or is yeah, it too premature? Yeah, yeah. You've been working on, what happened to your book with Al, about Alton Parker, the only failed presidential candidate who doesn't have I a I thought about that. And, and actually, I had a publisher who was interested, an academic house. Okay. But they don't pay well. They don't pay well. It, it seemed like a, a reasonable house, nonetheless that they seem to be able to generate some publicity and, and, and put out a nice product. I think what, well, aside from the fact that it was about Alton Parker and not the 1904 presidential race. Yeah, who lost to Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt in a, yeah. in a and landslide. And who was a judge. Yeah, who was a judge. They used to put judges, take them off the bench and put them in the game, Yeah, you know? Um, they, the, the guy mentioned to me, well, we do peer review. Okay. And it's like, I don't think I want peer review. Yeah, don't you know who I am? I, I, this is what I do. I don't, I don't have peers. I don't have peers. I've written a giraffe. I have. Probably. Maybe. <laughs> Let me ask my wife. Right. That's your peer review. My wife's my peer. That's right. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't think I want to do this yeah. because I don't write like an academic. Right. You're, the kind of books you write, you can read them on the plane on the beach, it's really fun. I really enjoy reading your writing. So it's like, I don't think I wanna do this. Right. Not that way, and in fact, I met this guy just at uh, in Carnegie Hall, we, we ended up having lunch with him the other day. How'd you get there? And uh, <laughs> practice, <laughs> practice. <laughs> and we walked up from 37th Street. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he had done a book and, and was, the first he had gone through peer review and I'm like, okay. And they, they kicked it around and now he had to do it again. And he said there were some improvements, but I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. So this memoir you're writing about, where you're talking about, you were discussing the the kind of the death of well, why don't you describe in your words like what you thought was cogent? The death? Well, talk about the death of kind of small town America, you were oh, yeah. to me. Well, it's I've been asked by a friend of mine for a few years to write a memoir. I thought, that's the worst idea I've ever heard. <laughs> it's a horrible idea. What about the League of Nations? Yeah. Well, that's a horrible worse idea. worse than that. Worse, worse. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we took her out for her birthday in January, and she said, uh, do it as a gift for me. Well, that's pressure. And I said, No. 
<laughs> yes. Push me around. But then the month after that, a friend of mine, one of my very closest friends, died. Oh. And I thought the stories die with me. Not about him, because what I didn't want to do was a whole autobiography. Uh, and she said, I, it doesn't matter what you write, just the way you say it. Yeah. Okay? I was like, nonetheless. Um, but I, I thought, well, I'll write it up to when I'm going away to college. Okay. And I come from a place, I come from upstate. I still am upstate. I'm very provincial. I live maybe 20 miles from, literally from where I was born. Okay. Went to school another 20 miles beyond that and largely have worked in that circle. Aside from my many, 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 many forays into the city. And this town, I can tell you the exact time in which it started to decay, January 1955, when the carpet mills moved out and the rust belt, the rust first appeared on the rust belt there in the Northeast. So there was this community. It had been functioning. It was working class, manufacturing, immigrant. The town was 75% Catholic. It was really... Biggest group was Polish. Second biggest group was Italian. It was the largest Lithuanian percentage in, you know, the state. Um, so it was, and it was very religious. It was a very religious time, and just things were different. So to explain to people what was different about them, it's like, let's do this. Let's write this down before it's forgotten. And, you know, people from my social background are not of a great literary bent. Nobody else is, is going to do this. I thought, but nonetheless, I thought, I'll write 20,000 words and self-publish it and show it to my friend. And sure. I did 74,000 words in three months. Oh, so this, re this was really a labor of love. When I found it quite cathartic. easy to do. Okay. And it was, it was... The community, it was what preceded it, it was genealogical, and you know, there's some about me and what, you know, how in in this complete scattershot way I came to be the guy with the name on the cover of these history books. Sure. And it's it's all of that stuff. I try in some way it's a bit like a Gene Shepherd novel, if you ever read it, read him, or Richard Russo. Richard Russo, who wrote a book called Mohawk, won the Pulitzer Prize. He's from the next county up above me. And there's a, there's a paragraph, which I first read, not from the book, but in the review of the book in the New York Times, talking about how desperate it was growing up there yeah. and the sense of doom. Okay, let's sum it up concretely. The first time I ever went anywhere overnight on a trip with my parents was to a place called Thompsonville, Connecticut. We had no relatives there, no friends. We stayed in a little motel. I know what we ordered. I know we watched Sergeant Bilko on TV in the room. And I know why we went. My father said, I want to see where my job went. Oh, wow. Oof. And we, he went out Good and Lord. we went and he drove to the factory gate and we got back in the car and we went home. And that's kind of the story of Amsterdam, New York. Good Lord. What's what's do you have a title? Uh too long ago. Yeah. Ooh, that's good. I'm gonna I got a question, I'm gonna put you on the spot. You're not gonna have a good answer, I don't think, because this is a tough one. I just you know sometimes you'll have an answer, then you'll think of the question. I'll I'll give you this is where I'm going with Whatever. This. What is your favorite title for a biography or autobiography and the reason i ask that question is i, I have on my shelf uh, gertrude stein's partner alice b toklas and her autobiography is called what is remembered and i'm like i love that title i remember a bio of joe mccarthy called when even angels wept oh that's good that's evocative yeah yeah 
That is, wow. Okay. That's a good answer. I guess I didn't have to put you on the spot. Okay, David, we're running out of time. What has been your favorite part of this interview? Oh, I guess the giraffe. <laughs> you are welcome. <laughs> so we take that clip and use that as the teaser. Yeah. At, like, what'd you like best about this episode? Yeah. So it's really even better yeah. when the answer makes no sense. Without <laughs> <it>. <laughs> I guess the giraffe. <laughs>